Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And I do pray God's peace to you and blessings to you. Welcome back to our Wednesday Bible class. And we just started our Sunday school in our Bible class, the you might say rally day, such as it is during the coronavirus was this past weekend. And we want to invite everybody to come back to be a part of our Bible class. Everybody kind of behaved themselves Sunday with the adults. They spread out in the gym and we have many tables. And I think you can pretty easily keep six feet away from anybody, maybe more than that, if you really uh, wanted to be wary there. And and I'm not suggesting you shouldn't, but um, and Sunday school, would the kids do that too in their Sunday school class. So I know we are few with our children, but they are those that God's entrusted to us. So we give thanks for them and uh, praise God for the opportunity to share the word with our little ones. So if you have little ones, bring them along. We, we want to have them back. If you have little neighbor kids, they are more than welcome to be with us too. Just you might give us a heads up on that so we can kind of figure out how to make sure that our tables are lined up where we want them to be and do everything the right way. But otherwise, wonderful day. It's wonderful to we have to try to get back into the swing of things. If I let's begin with the prayer so don't forget that in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, we praise you for the gift of your word and uh, that you promise us, though heaven and earth pass away, your word will never pass away, and that you have provided for us a good and faithful word to read and study and grow, and guide us by your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we went, we were, were partway through Matthew. We did not get to finish Matthew 18 last week, so we, we made it through verse 10, I think, and then we had to call our quits at the one-hour mark, and and uh, so we're looking at our passages for today, and I'm deeply conflicted in this respect because I didn't want, I, I wanted to possibly ignore this because it, it really isn't a, a big deal in some ways, but then I thought maybe it's something that, that we need to talk about. And if you're reading through the gospel for this past Sunday, and reading along with us in our Bible class, you'll notice an odd thing about our text, starting at verse 10. See that you do not despise one of these little ones, for I tell you that in heaven their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. Um, I don't know if I actually talked about verse 10 this past week, so I'll, I'll push back what I was thinking about for a second. But Luther said about this passage that we should always see there's you know guardian angel talk is a different we don't hear that kind of talk in scripture but in scripture it is clear that even the little ones have angels who always see the face of the father in heaven the the, the church has its michael saint michael is the angel of god's people in the book of daniel so i think we're on on good grounds to talk about guardian angels and that kind of thing as long as we don't make give the impression that my dead grandma has become my guardian angel that's totally unscriptural uh, people are people and angels are angels and when i die i don't become an angel I wait for the resurrection and my soul goes to be with Christ. Angels are a total, totally different part of God's creation. Really, they're the crown of God's invisible creation. Uh, so there's that. Luther told talked about this passage and he said that we should tell children and re always remind them that God the Father has sent the, an angel. They have their angel that's with them, watching over them and uh, keeping them through the day. And even Luther would say even, and uh, tell them to behave themselves because they because they don't want to, you know, I'm, I'm paraphrasing. I don't know how he, exactly the phrasing he uses, but you don't want to misbehave with your angel around, right? That's the good law part. Then the gospel is, this is how much your God loves you. He's called you to be a son or a daughter of Christ through faith in Jesus. And he has, sends his angels to stand guard over you. Of course, that part's all completely biblical. Hebrews 1 says, are not all angels God's ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? So God's angels do serve us, Hebrews 1.14. God's angels do serve him and, and help and protect us. So this is a very beautiful passage, and I, I 
I just reiterated or, or revisited that maybe because I wasn't sure if I remembered to go or got to verse 10 last week. Now, the part that was is strange is from there is their angels always see the face of my father who is in heaven. And this is the part I thought maybe I'll just ignore. I don't want to scandalize or hurt anybody. But if you're attentive there and you note in verse 12 that it goes from verse 10 in Matthew 18 to verse 12. What do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the 99 on the mountains? And I would, if you, here's the reason I didn't want to bring it up because I didn't want people to think, oh, there's a, there's something wrong with my Bible or somehow I have, a, or maybe that whole concept that we're about to just visit for a moment I don't want it to scandalize you to think that that you do not have a good and faithful, reliable word from God. We believe that the Bible is the inspired and inerrant word of God, that it is reliable. All scripture, 2 Timothy 3, 16 says, is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for rebuke, correction, and training in righteousness. Remember right before that he said, from infancy, Timothy, you've known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise unto salvation. Scripture is able to make you wise unto salvation because it is the living Word of God. It's inspired by the Holy Spirit. Second Peter 1.21 says, holy men of God spoke as they were carried by the Holy Spirit. They spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And if you read Second Peter 1, it's clear he's not just talking about their verbal utterances, but explicitly he's talking about their written words. And you go to the end of chapter 3, and he includes very emphatically, Peter does, he equates the scriptures of the Old Testament with the epistles of St. Paul there in Second Peter. So I'll, I'll commend that to you. You can look it up on your own. But so what's, so what is missing here in verse 11. If you look down at your Lutheran study Bible, this is the best Bible, I think. It, you better have good eyes. If I were you, I would, if you buy a Lutheran study Bible, which you should because it's expensive, but the Bible shouldn't be the cheapest thing you look for. All right. If it's, you know, it's cost as much as a couple lawn chairs. So get a Lutheran study Bible, get the large print because the small print is too small get the large print. Verse 11, if you'll note, there's, there is where verse 11 should be in your study Bible. There's a, a superscript number three in italics. And if you follow that to the bottom right of that page before it gets to the the commentary that that kind of walks you through and helps the devotional commentary that's in the study Bible, that superscript number three in italics says verse 11 would be for the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. So what that's telling you is the editors of the English standard version did not, did not think that the, the textual, the manuscript evidence was strong enough to include what has what what is thought of as verse 11 here for the son of man came to seek and to save the lost now here's the reality and and is we hold on and believe that the bible is god's word because he promises to maintain a, a reliable faithful word for his church but the truth is that the bible was inspired of god and is inerrant and infallible. It's not possible to fall or error or be in error in its original autographs. In other words, as the apostles wrote it. But we recognize too that after the apostles finished writing the scriptures, and Matthew was probably written before the fall of Jerusalem, because because Matthew doesn't mention the fall of Jerusalem, would be pretty significant otherwise. So this is probably written in 60, 66, maybe AD, 60, 65 AD, sometime before the fall of Jerusalem. And our earliest manuscripts 
approach within a century of that, but there was a period of time where it was transmitted by, had, had to be written down and transmitted and handed on. And that wasn't done with Xerox. That was done with, with people that, that were copying it line by line. And if you li- read about the monks and the, and the early rabbis that transmitted the scripture, you'll see the incredible safeguards that they took to make sure that it was meticulously accurate and faithful before that, before that written copied version would get would get approved. Otherwise, if if the guy messed it up and he kept making mistakes all over, they'd just destroy that and and start over and make a new copy. But it had to be done with a hand. Well, okay. So here would be my point. Sometimes people can be scandalized by the thought that there might be manuscripts in existence that did that had, say, for instance, verse eleven, which the English Standard Version doesn't include at all. I think that here's here's the way I would think about that: is we believe from the outset, a priori, you might say, that that the Bible that we have is faithful and reliable and true on the basis of the promise of the living God that Jesus said in John 17, verse 20, I pray for for you, the 12, the disciples, but also for all who are going to come to believe in me through your words. So if if God has preserved for his church a faithful word that is going to awaken faith, in, and Jesus knew that that would awaken faith in the hearts of his people, this is a promise of Jesus that we can rely on. And that takes it out of the realm of, okay, I don't believe Jesus is my savior because the Bible says so. I know it's the song and it's it's not wrong. It's okay. But it, it really is the other way. It's because Jesus broke through the bonds of death that every claim Jesus made must be absolutely so. Because if Jesus defeated death and the devil, then everything Jesus said is true because he's the living God. He's the one he claimed to be. Jesus claimed he was the son of God. God raised him from the dead. That's pretty much God the Father's stamp of authenticity on Jesus as being faithful. So we can go back into scripture and say, well, if Jesus is put his, 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 if he's defeated death and the devil for us, and he says, you can go by my word, then you can go by it. Other verses there, John 8, for instance, says, if you continue in my word, you're truly my disciples, and you will know the truth. Jesus is saying the word of the disciples, if you continue in my word, you will know the truth. God's word is truth. Um, We already talked about Matthew 24. Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away in Matthew 24. How about John 10, 35, where Jesus is, is, is really talking about the Old Testament scriptures when he says the scripture cannot be broken. Doesn't get a, a stronger, it's true, it's reliable, it's faithful. Or in John 17, verse 17, Jesus said, sanctify them in the truth. Thy word is truth. God's word is true. We have that and we know it because Jesus said it would be kept true. And we see it in the history of the reliability. Now, we're reading English translations of what was originally an inspired Greek text. So, whenever... I look and see that the editor skip verse 11 rather than being being I want to try to and I would say secondly I talked about the a priori reason for accepting the holy scriptures because Jesus put his stamp of authenticity on it in advance the second is because after scientific investigation we find that it's incredibly reliable in such a way that no other ancient manuscript even comes close, both by the incredible, incredible volume of manuscripts we have 
in comparison to others that historians generally consider reliable. It's not even close. We have so many more. And then the reliability of those those manuscripts. Now, that isn't to say that there are some places where you can't find in the manuscripts that we have available, which are many, that there are some differences and distinctions that we have to weigh. This is one of them. Okay, it's it's clear that the the authors or the editors of the ESV, as they were translating it, said that the best manuscript evidence that we have doesn't include verse 11. And so you look back in and you see that the ancient church father's origin, who was around 250 AD, um, Justin, who translated the Vulgate, uh, is, is, was about 380, 350, 380 AD. Those early church fathers did not include that and interact with that. In fact, it's it's a couple centuries later that we find the manuscript evidence that includes for the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Does that bother you? Well, that verse, the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost, is Holy Scripture. And you find it in Luke 19, 19 verse 10. Remember uh, Zacchaeus. Um, there's rejoicing because now Zacchaeus has become a child of God and he's, you know, Jesus went to stay at his house. He's the guy that climbed up the tree. So, and, and then it says at the end of 19 verse 10, for the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. So even if we admit, wait, this is strange. There's a manuscript discrepancy here. Even if it were to be granted that that belongs here, the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. It is already in Scripture. So that so if you could say that was an error in the manuscript or a discrepancy in the manuscript evidence, you'd have to say it in no way impacts the reliability and the faithfulness of Scripture. Actually, it just reiterates or restates it in a different place. So these editors had to ask themselves the question, okay, we later on in the manuscript evidence, apparently not early enough for the early church fathers to know verse 11, the way it's, it is in your study note there. So they had to decide, well, okay, what makes more sense that, that verse 11 is original and that the early writers just decided for whatever reason to take it out or to think that it isn't original and that somebody at a later point had it included for some reason. Who knows? Maybe he's, it's dark. They don't have LED lights. Maybe he's looking up from his candlelight and he, his eye falls on Luke 19 and he puts it in there. The editors made the judgment that it makes more sense that it wasn't original and was came was brought into the text later on rather than that for some reason the early evidence that the early people interacting with Matthew 18 just threw it out that really doesn't make any sense at all so anyway so if this is bothersome to you and and it can be frustrating because it's true we'd like to I'd like to show, oh see we've got the inspired text here it is all you got to do is learn to read the Greek this is why we do translations, because not everybody can read Greek. And even in the Greek text, there are some differences. And I want to talk about those just, just a little bit, keeping in mind God has preserved for us a reliable text. In its, in its original autographs, the scripture is inspired, and is without error, and is infallible. It's God's word. And we can say with with certainty that but God's word is reliable and faithful and that this scripture is true. You can can believe it and take it to the bank. But we don't have to get in a fight over verse 11, okay? It's not uh it's not an issue uh, as far as as far as well you're not a, a believer in you're not a true believer in holy scripture because you don't have a verse 11 in your Lutheran study Bible. That would be silly. So what kinds of, what kind of differences and, and I don't want to say contradictions, but discrepancies do you find 
in the manuscript evidence most often? Well, there's they're kind of come in in different ways, and and the first one would be like sp spelling errors, and generally these are very easy to to recognize. There are places where where names are are misspelled, Nazareth versus Nazaret, or uh, David, the name of David comes in Elijah, Elias. Sometimes you see is a, a discrepancy in the spelling. Uh, Moses, John, uh, John, uh, sometimes found in the manuscript evidence with two ends, sometimes with one. What difference does it make? It doesn't. It's and it's a noon in Greek anyway. Is the letter not an end? But uh, you know those are differences, but. And and there are some that are are clearly nonsense kind of errors where where a copyist as he's writing something might have pushed two words too close together that they ran together. Those, but those things are easily and obviously uh, dealt with. Okay, so it's that those errors are really easily corrected, and we can can see those. The other things are, are things like minor changes in word order. You do see that in, in scripture. And it's, it's, I'm told that in, in the Greek grammar that you can write a Greek sentence in 18 different ways and it still say and mean the same thing. So sometimes a copyist as he's going through flip-flops the word order and it doesn't change the sense of the text and and that would be another example of the kind of variant texts that that we have to deal with and understand as we look to see okay does verse 11 belong or not okay other kinds are are an example would would of discrepancies in the manuscript evidence that are meaningful kind of differences, but don't, nothing hangs on, on the salvation of, of one being the, of, you know, one being the correct one or the incorrect. One example there would be uh, 1 Thessalonians 2 verse 9, that, that, it's the the main reading of First Thessalonians two nine calls it the gospel of God. He's proclaiming the gospel of God, and there's a late uh, medieval or it's it's I think it's a medieval copy manu of manuscript that has the gospel of Christ. There is a a error there that is, in a way, it's meaningful because. Um, well, it's it, you. You don't know why those kinds of errors come in there. The overall manuscript evidence in that place points in in one direction because it came in so late. The the gospel of Christ, as opposed to the gospel of God, which is much earlier. So you know the weight of it falls to the the that it be in the gospel of God. I mean, it's a meaningful difference, but it's kind of easily ferreted out there. The, the, as you balance those manuscripts. And, and there are other passages like this one that are, are meaningful and, and to, you know, that you have to deal with and recognize. And, and this is, I think, falls into that category. And maybe it, another one that we'll talk about in, in a little bit too. But, you know, there's, if, if sometimes you notice this, that there are some passages in Scripture, like in John 8, if you read the first portion of that text, follow the footnote there, and you can say, hmm, what does that mean? If you come to Mark 16, is probably the most famous example of this. In Mark 16, you follow the footnotes in your English Bible in Mark 16, and you'll recognize that some of them, the texts, have it ending at verse 9, and some have it continue, or verse 8, and then some have it continue through verse 20. And the reason is because the earliest manuscript evidence in Mark 16 has it end earlier it, at the short ending, so-called. The later manuscript evidence has it go from verses 9 through 20. And so as they weigh it, they have to decide a, verse 9 through 20, there's nothing in it that is contrary to Scripture. It's all very good and faithful to Scripture. But if that part was original, is it more plausible that that 
the earlier writers would just drop it for some reason, or more plausible that it, the later writers that later writers added in. Now, this is this is kind of an involved discussion all by itself, but I've always kind of went with the Linsky approach from from um, the famous Greek New Testament commentary is saying is that it would would be to say that. I believe that God's given a faithful passage and text. I believe that Mark 16, 16, which is really um, an important and well-known verse to us, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. Whoever does not believe will be condemned. Uh, I like that that passage and it's the catechism, you know, we confess it as, as pastors, we're bound to, to confess this because it's the word of God there, Mark 16, 16, whoever believes and is baptized. But um, so you know, some some people of goodwill will say, well, maybe it ends at verse eight. And somebody added later on, I, I would make the argument with Lenski that somebody adding it later on doesn't doesn't negate the possibility that it also is God's inspired word. I mean, whoever added it, God could have inspired him to write it because this is the way he wants it to end. For example, Deuteronomy, which we know the books of Moses were written by Moses. It ends with an account of Moses' death going up the mountain. Did Moses write that and then walk up the mountain and die? I mean, he could. But it's not beyond the realm of possibility in my mind to accept that God the Holy Spirit inspired somebody to describe that ending. And it's preserved for us because God wanted it to be. Hey, you know, maybe that's naive. I believe it because Jesus rose from the dead and told me I have a faithful word I can rely on. So I'm never going to let anybody pick it apart and, and despise it. All right. It's it's I would say this, too. The early church is very brilliant in putting hedges around Holy, the doctrines of Holy Scripture so that we could be 100% certain, okay? And by that, I mean, by that, I mean, the, the Gospels and, and, the, and the passages, the, the epistles of Paul, there are a few passages or books in Scripture that were considered what the word was anti-legomena. In other words, they, they didn't disbelieve that they were God's word, but there was question about them. Pat, books like Hebrews, like Revelation, like Second Peter, and I think Second and Third John. Um, I don't remember how many I just counted up there. Is they said, okay, it's not that we don't believe this. This is God's word. But if somebody wants to get in an argue with met with me, I don't want to argue about that. So we're going to base all of the doctrines of Holy Scripture on clear and obviously attestable words that the whole church has come to agreement that they've come down to us through the apostles because Jesus told us the words of the apostles are faithful and true and can be trusted their truth he said so i think that that's the way to think of of mark 16 verse 16 this passage in the catechism is we say well um, how can baptism do what benefits does baptism give and under this, the proof text is Mark 16, 16, because we believe it's God's word. But if you want to, so, so here's the doctrine that we're wondering about. Does baptism save you? Mark 16, 16 clearly says, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. We would use that with our Baptist brothers and sisters, because they probably wouldn't look at us and say, hey, you know, that one's who you know that might not be god's word so we, we would use that there but if they did or if somebody said well you never know that wasn't in the original text which we can't know we just can't know the doctrine of salvation baptism is a means of salvation and a means of of grace would is clearly established in other places that are not argued against do you see how that works? So we want to establish the doctrine on the texts that the church 
has come to complete agreement on. And yes, these verses help us and we, we like to use them. And we, so whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but you don't need it to prove baptism saves us. Titus 3, 5 says, he saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. There's, so you have a passage already where he's talking about baptism. He saved us by the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. And I'm just going to go into the save passages. But, you know, Ephesians 5, Jesus sanctifies his church and makes her holy through the washing of water with through the word baptism again. Or 1 Peter 3, verse 21 Baptism doth also now save you. So these are the seat of doctrine passages. This is, these are the passages we go to and ground that. And then having established that it's a fact, baptism saves you, we'll bring in Mark 16, 16. So that, that's the fourth kind of discrepancy. And I think that this passage probably belongs right there too. You know, this is what's the correct text. Is it, does it include, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost? The short answer is, it kind of doesn't matter. That's a, that is part of Scripture already, Luke 19, 10. So, you know, it depends what you're trying to argue. If you're trying to argue it because you want to say to Christians, look, you don't even know what your Bible really says or is, then that's where the church was very smart in, in meticulously grounding the doctrines of the faith in those passages that were unshakable. And not that I'm conceding. I would just say, I, I do think that this ESV passage without verse 11 is probably more likely. Um, doesn't but bother me if you include your verse 11 because it's already in Scripture. So, all right. I don't know. Maybe that's clear as mud. I want to let me say this. 31 minutes. Boy, I'm going long. Okay. Luther said this. He, it's, Luther said this about Scripture. He says, those who argue against Scripture and say Scriptures are far too weak and should be, and, and we, that we should silence heretics with Scripture, reason must do it and it must come forth from the brain. Right? So in other words, some say, well, you got to use your brain. You can't argue from Scripture. Thus, one must prove that the, this faith is the right one. But our faith is above all reason, Luther said, and it alone is the power of God. Therefore, if the people will not believe, then be silent, for you are not held to compel people to receive Scripture as God's book or God's word. It is enough if you give the reason, therefore. But if they take exception and say, you preach that one should not hold to man's doctrine and yet St. Peter and Paul and even Christ were men. When you hear people of this stamp, Luther said, who are so blinded and hardened as to deny that what Christ and the apostles spoke and wrote is God's word or doubt it, then be silent. Don't argue with them, he's saying. Don't argue with them. Let them go. Only say, I'll give you reasons enough from Scripture. If you will believe it, it is well. If not, go your way. Right? You can't argue somebody into believing Scripture. We believe it because Jesus rose from the dead, and that's a historical fact. I mean, it's just obvious that Jesus, the person, is a historical fact. And you have to grip, grapple with either he's Jesus is, is either crazy, he's a liar, or he is the God that he claimed to be, the Son of God and Son of Man. And the only one that really accords with reality is to understand that that grave was empty. Jesus was legit dead. Even the Muslims, even the Jews who have, have the most at stake to deny it, don't deny Jesus died. Nor do they deny that the grave was empty on the morning, on Easter morning. Now, they have their own, you know, they'll say, well, the disciples stole the body. And then you that's that's gives us the opportunity to say, well, that would be strange, wouldn't it? If the disciples stole the body and then they all went around the world and died preaching something they knew wasn't true. That doesn't make sense. All right. Well, the other thing is the Christian faith started in Jerusalem where it would be most obviously disproven if Jesus hadn't risen from the dead. 
It was first witnessed by women who weren't considered reliable witnesses back then. So if they were trying to pull a hoax, they would have buried the fact that the women were the one that, that found the body of Christ. Then, then the other consideration there is, among many others, is that the Christians started worshiping. I mean, these were Jews. They started worshiping on Sunday immediately after Easter. What changed? What caused them to go from worshiping on the Sabbath day by God divine command to worshiping on Sunday? Well, something pretty significant had to change. Namely, that's the day Jesus rose from the dead. And also that's when, when the resurrection appearances in Scripture are. Here's Luther when he's talking about a, a Christian refusing to accept God's word as inerrant. Um, Luther says, I make use of the secular writings, that is, the people who write and study and the archaeologists and those people that write histories to help us understand the climate and what was going on at the time in, in the days of Jesus. I make use of the secular writings in such a manner that I am not forced to contradict Scripture. This is Luther. For I believe that in the Scriptures, the God of truth speaks. In the histories, good people display according to their ability, their diligence and fidelity, but only as men, or at least that their copies, copyists have perchance erred. In other words, people can make mistakes, even historians that tell us what the world was like in Jesus' day. But Luther says, but I won't believe that the Bible is, is full of errors. Likewise, Luther maintains the inerrancy of Scripture against natural scientists. Here we would think of uh, people who said, for instance, God didn't really create in six days or that he used evolution or whatever. Luther, he says, when Moses writes that God created heaven and earth and all that is in six days, then let it stand at that, that it was six days. And you dare not find a gloss how six days were one day. See, back then that's how they would have went. Nowadays, they go six days or, or billions of years. Um, and Luther continues, And if you cannot understand how it could have been done in six days, then accord the Holy Ghost the honor that he is smarter than you are. Luther says erudite here, or the translation. So I just love that. I, I mean, that's how I deal with these issues in Scripture. Verse 11, is it there? Is it not? God's smarter than I am. He's able to give me a word that I can rely on. And he's done it because he's not going to send his son to die on the cross and then leave a mystery and never give the, the world the faithful witness to that truth. All right. I'm sorry. It's, it's been so long. Verse 12. What do you think if a man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray? This is Matthew 18, verse 12. I'm starting again after that 37 minutes. Does he not leave the 99 on the mountains and go in search of the one that went astray? You know, this is this is a little different than there's no textual difference here. OK, the manuscript evidence is strong. But if you notice, you read this same thing, the parable of the lost sheep in Luke 15. And it's a little different in that here, when he tells the parable, he leaves off the part about there's more rejoicing in heaven over the one sinner who repents. That's not here. It is in Luke 15 when he tells the parable of the lost sheep. And the reason is, I think, this, because the context here is Luther is talking about, the, the real context here is not, the context here is Jesus is saying, Jesus isn't Luther, I didn't mean that, I'm sorry, is Jesus's point here is that God wants to, us to go out and look for the lost one. We should be, remember he said, don't cause God's little ones to sin. It's better for you if you get chucked in the lake and drowned, right? God wants us to go and search and to bring back his little ones. And that doesn't necessarily mean the, the infants and the babies. It means every child of God who born again in faith wanders from that faith. He wants, that's the point he's making, and that's why it doesn't add what it does in Luke 15. If you remember in Luke 15, the point of that passage is in Luke 15, the Pharisees are questioning Jesus, how come you go hang out with those people? 
So Jesus' point in Luke 15 is they weren't willing to accept the, the tax collectors and sinners. They looked down on those people. But his point in, in Luke 15 is exactly in heaven, they're rejoicing when God brings them back. Shame on you for not rejoicing. Here, he's teaching us as church to go out and search. If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them is gone astray, does he not leave the ninety-nine on the mountains and go in search of the one gone astray? The implied answer is, the required answer is, yes, he leaves the ninety-nine and goes to search for the one who's gone astray. And if he finds it, truly I say to you, he rejoices over it more than over the ninety-nine that never went astray. I mean, just kind of a different version of the same thing, but he celebrates, he rejoices bringing the lost back. And that's God's call for his church too. It's God wants us to, to restore those who wander and to speak where you cannot make people repent. If you have a family member that's wandered from the faith, I, dear God, we pray that, that he lead them back because he's the only one that can but he's going to use our words. And we so we pray that God help us to speak faithfully and to, to have the kind of conversation with the person that either helps them through the struggle they're going through, or maybe it's the person who's just flat lazy that, that we help people to see that we speak God's truth in law and gospel. This is important. You don't want to starve your faith. Come back to Christ and to his church. And to remind them that God can help them through this. It's a struggle to change who we are, but Jesus came to save us and he's able to get, get to help us carry us through even bad habits like skipping church. All right, I don't know. You know, just pray that God help you through those conversations so that we can, can wisely share the word and that, that there can be rejoicing over that nine, that one, over that one who's, who's found. Verse 14, so it is not the will of my Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. Um, all right, I don't want to. So it's, it's God's will is not that any one of his little ones, the Father in heaven, that any one of his little ones should perish. So this is the death knell for Calvinism, right? That Calvin would say, okay, God created some are going to be saved, some are going to be damned. And that's just the way he made it. No, God wants all to be saved. He is utterly sincere that everyone be saved. Will all be saved? No, but it's not because God created some to be damned. If you're saved, it's by grace alone. It's God's gift. It's God's work. He's the one who searches out and finds his lost sheep and restores it. But if you're lost, it's because you're wandering. Stop wandering. And even as you hear that law, Quit wandering. You're going to die in your sins and be damned. The Holy Spirit uses it, uses it. It might not happen right away with your family or loved one or whoever it is or the neighbor that you keep inviting to church, but keep speaking. And I'm not saying just speak words of law and judgment to them. I We need to, to also point them to grace and Christ, our Savior, and invite them back to hear and to to be fed by that promise of life that we have in Christ. It could take forever. Who knows how long it's going to take, but don't lose a moment in sharing that word. Here's another example verse, verse in verse 14. So it is not the will of my father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. Um, I think, you know, some of your English translations, I don't know what the NIV says, will say there is not the will of your father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. And that is the that's this the distinction between a moan and he moan in in scripture. And it's a one it's it's one letter. So or or maybe it's mu in uh, the Greek. Well, I'll have to go back and look. But it's one of those examples of of a manus a difference in the manuscript that the weight on whether it's the weight is pretty even so i think that there might be the niv might go a different direction or the king james might go a different direction 
Uh, my guess is the King James follows, because I, I think the ESV follows the King James. But think about, so so at some point, the the copyists in a, a manus, these manuscripts, there seems to be some that that passed down you, your father in heaven, my father in heaven. And it falls in the category, of, in my opinion, of, I think, I guess you could say it's significant. If you say your father in heaven, then it maybe is a stronger verse to ground Jesus' deity, his eternal deity as the second person of the Trinity. But there's no doubt who's being talked about, is there? If you read it, it's not the will of your father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish then the disciples know that their heavenly father wants everybody to be saved and that's true they have the reason i think that they have, have opted for the my is because and this is another example of how how many of these how irrelevant some of the the discrepancies in the textual uh, the manuscripts are is you notice my father is in verse 10 it is see that ne that you do not despise one of these little ones for i tell you that in heaven their angels always see the face of my father and at the end in verse 35 which apparently we're going to have to wait till next week to do but in verse 35 again at the end of of matthew 18 Jesus says, so also my heavenly father would do to every one of you. So I think the ESV editors in that case said, well, is it your heavenly father? In other words, the disciples heavenly father? Is it Jesus heavenly father? It's the same heavenly father either way. So they opted for the my, possibly because two other times in this chapter, he uses the my heavenly father language. That's an example of, of some of the things that people will try to say, well, you don't even know what the real text is. Well, we know for certainty that that change or other spelling changes, they do not in any way impinge on the, the strength and authority of the biblical text. It's the same Father in heaven. Whether he says yours or my, it's the same Father in heaven. All right. I'd probably beat that to death. You know, the more important part of that is really it would it, in verse 14 is that it's not God's will that any perish. Because I do think Calvinism is obnoxious in that, in the great danger of saying, well, some, God's created some to be saved and they're going to be saved regardless because they are God's elect and he's going to do that and some to be damned, and they're going to be damned regardless because that's because that's God's created them to be that. That false doctrine of John Calvin is very damaging. It affirms, yes, it affirms that salvation is by grace alone, and that's true, but it also makes God guilty of, of the damnation of the unbeliever. It makes God responsible for the rejection of Christ. And that's so clearly contrary to Holy Scripture. And, you know, um, Ezekiel 33, verses 11 and 12, I think it is, or 10 and 11, where he says, it's not God's will that anyone should perish, but all to come to repentance. I think it's 10 and 11. Look it up, Ezekiel 33. God wants all to be saved. It's not his will that any should any should perish. And the other damaging thing about the doctrine of, of for those that say God creates and damns some just because is A, it makes God malicious, you know, guilty of being just an ornery and, and capricious God who who damns just for the heck of it or whatever reason. That's a terrible thing to think about God. But it also is demoralizing. It leaves you, it, it might lead somebody, you preach the gospel to somebody like that, and they might say, well, what does it matter what I do or what I believe? If I'm damned, I'm damned. If I'm saved, I'm saved. So I'm just going to continue going along. And, you know, the scripture is completely the opposite of that. You know, Psalm 95 and in, in Hebrews kind of quotes that so often in chapter 4. Today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts. Right? Don't harden your hearts. Act on it now. 
You don't want somebody to hear the word and say, well, you know, if God made me to be damned, I'll be damned. That's a terrible way to think. We want all to be saved, and so does God. Um, if your brother causes you to sin, verse 15, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. So we're still in the context of God wants all to be saved in the proclamation of the word. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. Now, we often use these in the context of church discipline, but I think it's, it's really anywhere in the body of Christ. It's not just a constitutional procedure to follow. It's if you have a brother or sister who's fallen into sin or has sinned against you, go to them, reprove them from God's word and, and show them the error. And if they and if they repent, then receive them back, welcome them back. If they've sinned against you, done something to hurt you, forgive them. I, whenever we should teach this in our families, whenever we hurt each other, we should confess our sins and, and the other person should speak God's absolution, that forgiveness of sins to us. The second part is, is take two or three others along. And so we might take another trusted brother or sister in Christ who also cares about the salvation of the person in question and go to them because you don't want them to be lost. The goal throughout Matthew 18 here is, the goal is to preach, to, to restore them and bring them back into the fellowship of the church. So 17, uh, if he refuses to listen to them, in other words, if he continues in un unrepentance, he's done something hurtful to me, he, he won't, won't confess it and be forgiven. He's refused the admonition of brothers and sisters in Christ that have gone to him. Then Jesus says, tell it to the church. Now, the church, this is the third time in, second time and the third time that the word church is used in Matthew. And it's used here in Matthew's gospel. I'm not sure it's used in any of the other gospels, uh, but used here in gospel in the gospels is the community of faith whose responsibility is to restore one another. Remember, Peter, Peter made the great confession and Jesus said, upon this confession, I'm going to build my church. The gates of hell aren't going to prevail against it. So this church is a community of believers. It's not a building. It's God's faithful people in whom the Holy Spirit has created faith. And the church, if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a, a Gentile or, 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 let me see, where did I go? as a Gentile and a tax collector. And that we would consider that excommunication. If they refuses to to listen to the reproof of the church, then he needs to be removed from the church and toward the end so that they be forgiven, so they be brought to repentance. So even that last step of removing somebody from the church, treating them as a Gentile or tax collector, is with the hope that they be, that they be restored. Now, that's true. We Sometimes that, that proclamation of the law, harsh as it may seem, is, is the last thing that's going to shake somebody. But the other side of it is sin is like a leaven. And we saw that in, in Matthew 13. We saw that already. Uh, sin is like a leaven too. And you don't want sin to spread. And you don't want the acceptance of sin to cause God's little ones to wander from the faith. So the church as a community of faith must stand up for what's true and must have the courage to do it. Now, this is the great tragedy of the splintering of the church in that so often, whenever a pastor or a church does ministry with somebody who's wandered, the church next door only to, well, so often nowadays, people don't care. They don't care if they're part of the community anymore. Well, that's God's business. Then we just tell them you need to repent and not so you're not damned. But too often, they'll just go to the church next door or they'll start their own church and say, hey, I'll have this church that they accept me. And uh, unfortunately, that's not, you know, the pastor that puts up with that and does that is going to be the pastor who endures a mighty, mighty judgment from God for, for not caring enough about God's children to speak the truth.
Uh, that was our Ezekiel 33 Old Testament lesson, Sunday, 7, 8, and 9. Um, that's the sad condition kind of of the church is, is if this church excommunicated somebody and they went, hopefully no Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod Church would accept that person without talking through with the previous church, the other congregation and understanding and you know, how do we go forward in ministry to this person? But, you know, very often it's the case that, for instance, that if I say to somebody, I'm sorry, if you're not, if you're living together with somebody outside of marriage, you need to repent. I cannot marry you in good conscience. I can't stand before God and pretend that this is okay. You need to first repent and then let's do the wedding. Let's get it. Let's get that wedding on the books. You repent of your sins. And very often they'll say, well, you know, I'll find somebody else. No, thanks. They go to this church down the street and just start going and not a word spoken. They just marry them and don't worry about it. Well, the problem is for a Bible believing church or a pastor, what if they die in the meantime? And what if they are never led to repentance? Right? What if they spend the rest of their life, maybe they live 50 more years, but in their minds they say, well, heck with that pastor. I wasn't doing anything wrong. Then are they saved? Have they ever come to repentance? You can say, well, yeah, there's been time, water under the bridge. But if they don't acknowledge it, are they truly repentant? You know, the ministry is hard and being church, God's church is hard. But we want to be faithful to Christ first and speak the truth in love. And that's the best way to be faithful to our people in our ministry to those people, because we want them to be saved. And sometimes that's gonna, gonna require, uh, if he refuses to listen to the church, you've got to excommunicate him. Now, verse 18 says, truly I say to you, whatever you bind, and here, remember in Matthew 16, it was singular. He said to Peter, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Whosoever sins you forgive, they're forgiven. He was talking, that was singular there. He's talking about Peter and, and his ministry on behalf of the church. We can see here in verse 18 that what he gave to Peter in the singular in verse 16, he gives to the whole church. So do not tell me that that St. Peter, and especially don't try to tell me that the bishop of Ro the, the Roman Pope is the equivalent of Peter, because he's not. But everything that he gave, the, the keys that he gave to forgive and to reprove sins in Matthew 16, he gives in Matthew 18 to the disciples as a whole. That you is in a plural. It doesn't come in easily in our English, but there it is. It's plural. Whatever you bind on earth, you, plural, shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. This is an echo of verse chapter 16 in the giving of the keys in Matthew 16. But if you have your Lutheran study Bible, look again. There's a note, an aha. It says there in the note, shall have been bound or shall have been loosed. Now, it's the same Greek word in both place, places. It's just the better translation of that, as we noted in chapter 16, of that Greek word, which is a perfect paraphrastic, and it's a future with a perfect paraphrastic. And it says, truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven. And here's the point. And there's a difference in the way you read it, is, is if you read it the way it's translated here, as opposed to way, the way the Greek original has it, is it almost makes it sound like the action of the pastor in binding or saying, your sins are not forgiven, or your sins are forgiven, is making something a reality happen in heaven. Like it has to happen here first by the pastor saying, you're not forgiven, or you are forgiven, and then it's gonna happen in heaven. But the text actually says it this way, whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven. In other words, there is a, pre, a preceding heavenly reality at work. When that person is an unbeliever, God knows it before the pastor has to tell him. There's a preceding reality that the pastor is announcing in the name of Christ. 
And he's, yes, announcing the fact of what's true already in heaven. But in that very announcement, God's word is active and it is doing exactly what the pastor is saying. So, but it wasn't a secret to God until the pastor disclosed it. That's why I think if you follow verse five there, the better reading of that, according to the Greek text itself is, whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven because God knows it already. Where there's faith, God sees it in the heart and that sin is forgiven. And the pastor, when the person comes and repents of their sins, the pastor has the joy of saying a truth that sin is forgiven, but that truth isn't just the mere observation of a fact that that sin is forgiven here on earth and in heaven. It actually, in the power of the word of God, does what he says, because God's word is living and active. So the very announcement of the fact does it. It pours that forgiveness into my ears, and that faith, faith is always born of what's heard, Faith comes from hearing the word. So it's just pouring it into the ears. And uh, likewise, for the when the sin is bound, that law that calls to repentance, when that sin is is bound on earth, when the pastor has to say to that, that person, since you don't believe this is a sin and you don't repent of your sins, your sins are not forgiven and you need to repent so you don't go to hell. Dear God, please bring this person to repentance. The pastor is only saying what's already so before God. And if you hear it, if your pastor speaks to you that word of God, of law or gospel, and it's speaking God's word, then you should receive it as though it's God's word, not as though it's his opinion, because he's announcing a fact that is already existing before the throne of God in heaven. All right, I'm going to, it's 101. Let me see. This is really long. I'm going to read the last. Again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I among them. Um, God's church is a community of faith where he lives in the midst of his people and where we're gathered together around his word. God stands behind it. And the context of that is completely is the context of disciplining a brother or sister in Christ so that they be brought back to the faith. And it's probably lived out most often among us in the context of a brother sinning against a brother and them refusing to forgive one another. Happens all the time. People just leave the church because they get mad. And uh, you're going to see that in the very next verse, he's going to deal with that very situation where forgiveness is refused. And that's going to carry on in verse 21. But let me say in closing, but it's also true in a general sense where two or three are gathered, Jesus is with us, even outside of the context of, of confession and absolution and calling someone to repentance and restoring a brother or sister in Christ. Jesus is present in his church. He's present there in his word. He's present with himself, his life-giving power. He said, I am with you always to the end of the age. So never think God's stuck at the right hand of God in heaven in some isolated, undisclosed place. He is at the right hand of God, which is to say he is everywhere. He is, is omnipresent because he's God. He's present with you right now, whatever you're going through. And he's present with his church where two or three gather. Dear Father in heaven, we pray you bless us as we encounter your word, as we're strengthened by your word. And give us great faith that you impart to us a, a reliable and faithful message of life and salvation. And we pray for all who have wandered, for ourselves when we wander, and for all our brothers and sisters that you would restore as it is your heart, that not one of these little ones be lost, and that there be rejoicing before you in your in your heavenly home. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.